1780s, a succession of famines made life intolerable here, and many people chose to quit the struggle altogether and to emigrate. A lot of them went to Canada. Now, such was the hemorrhage of manpower that local landowners actually petitioned the government for troops to help them keep people on the land. But what a different story a century later. In 1880, the Mackenzie still living here got noticed to quit. But instead of being glad to leave, they now fought to stay. And when bailiffs arrived in a rowing boat to throw them off the land, they were attacked by women who stripped them naked and forced them back again. Now, a bare-faced cheek, you might think, but at least the women had won the right to stay. I was fascinated by this early example of Highland girl power. To find out more about the role of women during the clearances, I met up with writer and historian Alastair McIntosh at a ruined township. But the glories of a Highland summer forced us to take shelter. The Highland evictions were reported by the London press in an intriguing way, like war reports. Here, for example, you can see the gunboats being sent into Sky in the 1880s, 1885, mm. and marines on the march going off to put down rent strikes in response to people being evicted and rent racking that well, was going this on. This is a very serious thing. These are armed troops, in yeah. a sense, being yeah. sent to Sky. Yeah, when yeah was right. that? In 18... gunboats. Well, that's 1885. 1880. Landing in Uig. The irony of all of this is that at the same time as many a Highland son would be fighting in India or whatever to maintain the power of the empire there, back home, their homes were being burnt around their heads. And then if I can show you this picture here, here's a, a similar illustration from this era of women in the forefront of the battle against the police and marines being sent in to put down rent strikes. And what's so interesting about this picture is that you can see how the sympathy of the media was with the people. The women are shown as being dignified. Look at this one, she's even smoking a pipe and so on. I mean, these are women with attitude here. And the, uh, the rowdy rabble is not the women, but rather the police and the marines coming to turn them off their land. What they were fundamentally fighting for was their sense of community. They understood community as being geographical, as being community of place, but also historical so that any person was connected intimately with all those who had gone before them. And they saw this being broken up by the Highland clearances, and they were determined to maintain that soul of the people. And when these images, these drawings of women struggling against landed power in the Scottish Highlands reached the genteel London public, I think the public started to waken up to the fact that what landed power was doing was not all that gentrified. Chiefs and landlords suddenly found themselves cast as villains in the great struggle for the Highlands. With the tide of public opinion moving against them, the callous evictions finally came to a halt. Across the highlands and islands, more and more communities now own the ancestral land beneath their feet. Yet it's only since 2003 that the right to buy has been enshrined in law. On the old Mackenzie estates in Assent, where crofters won the right to buy their land, I met John Mackenzie. His fields are littered with stones that powerfully symbolize the connection between the past and the place he calls home. Every stone represents the labor expended by my forebears to transform this land from its original virgin condition into land capable of being cultivated and growing crops. They cleared the stones from the surface and then as the land was being ploughed, each stone that came up would be carried in a creel and deposited in a location that uh, wouldn't otherwise uh, be capable of being cultivated. It's quite a uh, desperate thing to do, is it not? Well, it, I mean, if you look around and see the numerous cairns that there are and attempt to count the stones, it'll give you an indication over the years the amount of effort that's been expended. 
I remember in my childhood, my grandfather cultivating this land. His predecessors had been cleared from Kirkton of Assent, and the idea that he would actually own the land or his successors would own the land just would never, ever enter into his head. But one thing I'm sure, and that is that he and those of his generation would have been delighted to see the wrongs of the history which were emblazoned on their entire psyche, having been righted, at least in some measure. Long before the Ascent Crofters won the rights to their land, their former clan chiefs, the Mackenzie Lords of Seaforth, suffered a different fate, an extinction event long ago predicted by the legendary Bronze Seer's final vision of doom. Now, when the Bronze Seer faced execution, it said he predicted a time when a deaf and dumb Mackenzie Lord would outlive each of his four sons and die without an heir. He would be the last of the Seaforth Mackenzies. Some 200 years later, the Bronze Seer's prophecy was eerily fulfilled with the death of Francis Mackenzie Humberston in 1819. His speech and hearing destroyed by scarlet fever, he died a deaf mute, having outlived his four sons. The ruins of Fortros Cathedral, just a few miles from Bron Castle, is where those Mackenzies, cursed by the Bronze Seer, were laid to rest. Now, Mackenzies have been buried here for generations, and the place is full of them. We've got a, an Alexander Mackenzie, a John Mackenzie, and a Kenneth Mackenzie here from Torridon. And over here is Sir Alexander Mackenzie of Cool, September 1796. And over here, we've got another Mackenzie, Captain Mackenzie, who died in 17, 1872. But this is what I'm really looking for. This is where our Mackenzie chief is buried. Now, it says here, underneath this monument are deposited the mortal remains of Francis Humberston, he's the Mackenzie, Lord Seaforth, Baron Kintail, and and his four sons, William, George, Francis, and another William. And this is significant. It says, in them terminated the male line of the Earls of Seaforth. Now, I can't help thinking that the last hours of Lord Seaforth must have been a, an agonizing torment, because he knew more than anyone else that his death would fulfill the Bronze Seer's prophecy and mark the end of the entire Mackenzie dynasty. For me, the death of Lord Seaforth, whether predicted or not, symbolizes the final collapse of the old clan system, a society based on kinship and honor. But as we romanticize and dress up the past, it's easy to forget that the reality of Highland life was brutal and bloody. Our ancestors were forced, quite literally, to battle for survival. In my journey through the history of Scotland's clans, it's the epic struggle for survival that's impressed me most. Now, the old clan system may have died, but there's still much to fight for. In the 21st century, the language, the landscape, and even access to the land itself is far from secure. So for all of us who value our clan heritage, the struggle for the highlands continues. <laughs>